Hello and welcome to Skein Dare Knits. My name is Ellie and I am a Norwegian living and knitting in London. And you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry as Skein Dare. And don't forget the Ravelry group Skein Dare Knits, which is where all things podcast related is going on, as well as a huge helpful section for all things Norwegian yarn and knitting it and what have you. So yeah. That's the place I highly recommend you go to check out. And I am enjoying myself a cup of tea today. I am very forgetful when it comes to having a beverage when I record. So then suddenly I sit here having a very dry voice at the end of the recording and wonder why. <laughs> so I brewed myself a cup of David's tea. And yes, it is as good as everyone says. And I put it in my Remembrances Pottery mug. Natalie makes the best ceramic mug because they're all knitting themed. So mine has a bunch of knitted sweaters on. And yes, I am drinking the Santa Secret tea, even though it's not Christmas, because quite frankly, I don't find the flavors very festive and uh, so yeah, I'll drink it all year round. But yes, let's get back to the usual. I want to inform you about some knit-alongs that are going on. Just briefly, I am doing the Marius knit-along. More on that in the Ravel group, essentially sweaters in that pattern. I am hosting the year-long knit-along. Hopefully one that will be going on every year, but yeah. Uh, also very open to double dipping into the basket of mittens cal, the year of the mitten and the NH Knits mitten knit-along. So it's mittens are happening you guys and it's really fun i am also running the february long uh along knit along for break the rules so we're breaking the rule of yarn weight we are knitting projects in the wrong yarn weight on purpose uh again more on that in the ravelry group but yes that is a knit along that's only going to go on february i don't have prices yet so that's something to look into but yes um Welcome to this podcast. I didn't say that. Welcome back if you are a regular viewer and of course welcome if you're checking this out for the first time. Hey, my goodness, this is episode 60. I was just watching the Legacy Nets uh, podcast and they were just like, we are finally out of the 50s and I feel the same way. I feel like I was stuck in the 50s for ages like just the 50s never left me now I'm in episode 60 and it feels pretty good and uh, I mean, the subscriber numbers keep keeps on rising, so just welcome on board, guys. I think we're gonna reach 9,000 soon, but we just hit 8,000. I can't keep up with this stuff. <laughs> and yes, we should probably also talk about what I'm wearing, which is a bit so-and-so. I mean, I'm wearing the lovely, beautiful, amazing Birkin sweater by Caitlin Hunter, who everyone's knitting yokes from. And I knit it in the most comfortable yarn possible, which is Laxins Limited BFL Massam with the hand-dyed BFL Massam with Sparkle by the Knitting Goddess in the yoke. Uh, the reason this is a bit of a sad one is that the fit is not good for me. Uh, so even when I was just like recording and I was back here, there is all this stuff. And I wear yokes a lot and it yokes all the time. I have a fairly good idea of the variety of ways that they can fit and I never had these issues before where it's like wide and then narrow and it's too tight here like here I can't move my arms if I do if I do anything this happens so I have to pull it down thoroughly around my arms every time and then I'm restricted and I can't move my arms so it's beautiful but it's not actually practical so I never wear this thing which is pretty sad uh so i mean if it fits someone else maybe i'll give it away or maybe i will rip out the yoke and see if i can put in some increases where i would have them because the increases that are happening here really should have happened up here i just feel very restricted not sure how long i'm going to be wearing it for this recording but i just wanted to show you how beautiful it is because it's an amazing design it's just not a very good fit on me it Puckers up and no, it's not because I dried it on a hanger and no, it's not because of the short rows. They are knit to the same gauge as the color work. It is because there are so many stitches up here and so few down here. The increases should have happened more in a, you know, sort of mathematically consistent way, I think. Uh, so not the greatest fit on me, but maybe if you have a different kind of shape where most of your uh, 
increased size happens up here and you don't really grow more beyond that if that makes sense so yes it's the Birkin sweater though it's from Lane magazine it's beautiful I just have a hard time wearing it <laughs> And actually it got really warm just now. This happens every time I start recording and I start blabbling. My pulse just goes straight up there. So I might just have a impromptu costume change very soon. But I thought before that we could dive straight into finished objects. It's not finished, finished, finished. I haven't woven in the ends yet and I haven't attached buttons. But yes, it is a garment and I have no idea when I made this. I'm sure it knitted itself overnight. But it's a Siri card again. Look at that. Look at that. It's done. I mean, it's cropped, so you're wondering why I finished it so quickly. Two reasons. I am knitting size medium, but above gauge, so it's a loser gauge. I don't know if above gauge means loser gauge, but that's what I mean. And uh, that made it quicker for me to reach size large, because really that was the fabric I preferred in this particular yarn. And it's cropped because, quite frankly, for me, if I knit a full-size sweater and pull that above my belly and bum, I look stupid. <laughs> it doesn't work. So for me, having it quite a loose fit, just like the sweater. Absolutely love the fit of the sweater. Around here. No, don't do that chair. I'm trying to stand still here. Love the loose fit around here. It's really flattering. I love the how I shaped the sweater, the rest of it, and I did sort of follow the pattern there, which is unusual. Uh, it's just like the yoke but yes here very happy with the fit of the yoke when I've tried this on and very happy with having this soft loose fairly short fit that I say it's cropped it does go just below my waist I have I think moved away from ending my cardigans just at the waist and I prefer ending the cardigan at the waist and then the rib goes kind of beyond the waist so it kind of flares a bit out again I find that it's actually it sort of, it still manages to emphasize my waist and makes me not feel like I'm getting cold around the waist. That not cold air seeps in there because I, I feel a bit naked. Uh, so yeah, that works out really well with this thing. Now you see there's a lot of ends that needs woven and weaving in. There are the ends of the um, button bands. There's that and there's the end of when I bound I don't even know what this end is. And there are the ends of when I crocheted on the steak. Let's talk about the steak because why haven't I just got through this already? I did do a swatch and I decided to steak the swatch. So I did the crochet thingy things. And Very Pink Knits has a very good tutorial on this. You should check that one out. Don't ask me to do tutorials. Something I will get back to in a bit. But yes, I uh, did steak the swatch I knit my swatch in a diamond shape that's a thing that I do so it's cut in half and it's not unraveling and I'm still freaking out and I mean if you are a long-term viewer of this podcast you know I am very very comfortable with steaking I will cut through any of my knits if they are knit in the right yarn and I think that is where I am stuck here because I don't know if this is the right yarn uh, it has a very interesting fiber composition where some percentage of it is Shetland yarn and Jacob and mohair and lots of things that stick really well. But another part of the percentage is merino and alpaca, which does not, which I should not cut through without some securing that is more secure than the crocheting, like the sewing machine. And, well, this hasn't unraveled but it has sort of moved it's sort of shifted a little bit like you can see there are these little things here they haven't unraveled or anything but they have sort of shifted that's how they can be this long and not in this sort of knitting stitch form and i'm getting very hung up on this right now so i'm kind of scared of staking my card again i know it happens to everyone it happens to me too so but here it looks really nice it's mainly just this side which might just be because i where I put the crochet thing but that means that the crochet thing is holding more of the stitches than the actual yarn is so I am a bit nervous and I would like to hear anyone's experience with this yarn or a yarn of similar composition um so yes the yarn is black yarns Cornish tin 2 um and I just don't know if I can steak it without sewing and if I have to sew. Should have done that when I was in Norway because mum had the sewing machine out and I can't sew to save my life so 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 <laughs> yeah a bit hung up on that right now but I have put in the crochet thingy things 
you know there are these crochet steaks that you put in the steak just where you're about to cut so you put it on each side so you can see it puckers a bit here it's in the same color which is why you can't really see it which is why i can't see it but it does really distinguish the bit that you're supposed to cut right in the middle here which is what i intend to do i just need to get a lot of wine and maybe dim the light a bit and mm, yeah no need to get the baileys out this way i need to <laughs> i don't even drink i don't know why i'm saying this stuff but yes um it's lovely though i really am happy with this i loved my modification every one of them i modified so that i had short rows worked in the stitch pattern so pretty much this distance here is short rows it's from a ravelry project that's called something to do with short rows in the series cardigan so it's a pink cardigan if you're struggling to find it and yeah it does add about this much i also worked in some short rows in the rib of the neck because i really didn't find that it needed to go much higher in the front but in the back i would still like something to kind of close around the neck because i have seen a lot of siri cardigans where they are open all the way around here and i don't want that so i just did everything in my power to do it differently also with regards to the needle size that i chose for the rib it was a lot smaller relative to the needle size I used for the body which was a lot larger than what was recommended by the pattern now pattern says 4mm which means for me I should knit 4.5mm to get a gauge of 20 stitches and I wanted 18 so I went with 5mm yes and it did really produce a very nice fabric it's still a bit wet here actually because it's been drying for a while and the bottom bits are still kind of humid uh, but yeah I uh, did I do anything else I think I did the sleeves are actually a bit longer but in the end they actually fit me maybe I have long arms I don't know have the modification is obviously knitting in the round which is why I have this now sticking conundrum happening and I also decided to knit it a lot shorter and it does actually have some subtle waist fitting very very subtle but I can try to show you if you can see the little decrease seam that is going on here I like a subtle waist shaping, just something that makes it not look baggy, but not at the same time be like wearing, you know, like a ski suit or something very tight. It doesn't work for me either. So something I've become very drawn to as a late and I seem to put into every garment that I am making. So I don't know if we can call this a finished, finished, finished object yet, but it's certainly off the needles, which means that I have marked it as finished on Ravelry because apparently those are the rules that I work from. And the most exciting thing about having this off the needles is that I have my project for the Black Air Yarns Knit Along for the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. I hadn't even announced my candidacy yet. I just cast on and I thought, oh, I'm not going to finish in time. Finish in time. I need to weave in the ends and put the buttons on and get the scissor out and just do it. Um, but yeah, I'm very open to any... Uh, experienced educated input on this what you think I could do that isn't sewing with a sewing machine uh, because I'm two reasons one is that I'm really not that good at sewing so I probably need help from someone the other reason being that I don't like what the sewing machine seam does to my knitted fabric it does add some rigidity to it and um, it makes this is not my native language in case you didn't know uh, it does make it kind of pull a bit tight there. You can't stretch it out as much as you can if you just have a crochet stick. I'm thinking maybe if I cut it, I can just like sew it gently to the side underneath and that will make it less likely to be messed about with and that will make it stay put. But I mean, the swatch is fine. I don't know why I'm getting so hung up on this. It really hasn't unraveled. It's just the fact that some of it moved a bit which actually has happened when i'm steaked with the yarn i know with 100 percent confidence that will not unravel when you steak so i might just be hung up for the wrong reasons you're not getting any focus that's fine it's fine I don't care it's fine. so i think i will be leaving this cardigan aside for now and see if i can gather up the courage to steak later i might bring you up to the wild and woolen at night tonight and ask some people there if they know what to do 
and then we could talk about my other project which I have worked on and this is the only other project I have worked on since the last time we saw each other because I have been very good and monogamous lately both in the past episode and this episode I was very monogamous in my knitting I don't know if that means I had less knitting time I don't think so because that's a whole garment you know uh, so maybe I'm just changing my ways and maybe probably definitely it's because i'm trying to get through all my whips and you really just need to take one at a time not to be overwhelmed because i love my whips and i don't want to be overwhelmed i want to enjoy each and every one of them um so i i think the next thing that i will be doing is uh try finish my transcendent socks um yeah but the other thing that i did knit on this week was the miss rachel yoke and it's sitting here right next to me turns out it is currently off the needles I managed to put in the body so last time we saw each other <clears throat> I had knit up to here and I had started the rib there and then I pulled out all the needles because I was like I don't want to start the rib there and I tried it on I was like actually I do want to start the rib there so it took me another week or two to put the needles back into the stitches which was fine because this doesn't unravel because that is what makes it so stickable I'm totally confident to stick this we'll get back to that um and then I tried it on again and I was like, actually, I don't want to start the rib this high up. And asked some friends of mine that were around at the time and decided not taking up the needles again and putting it further up, ripping out the rib and knitting another, what was it, three centimeters or so down here or four. Then I added between five to six centimeters of rib here, which again gives this sort of nice shape that this sweater has, although I didn't split the hem. Which why, really, didn't I? That's one of the loveliest things about this thing, is that it's so loose, nice loose fit. But this, oh god, no, I'm not gonna talk about that. Look how matchy they are though. It really does speak to me, both of these kind of neutral heathered colors with the bright, bright colored yoke. And again, a yoke that fits me a lot better. You can see there is a very even increase of stitches here, as opposed to having lots of increases up here, nothing here, and then lots down here. That is the difference that I'm trying to explain, basically. Uh, and yeah, it's very close to being finished. I probably could have finished it by the time I recorded this if I had set up knitting instead of trying to finish my transcendent sock pattern. And so what I have left now is the button bands sewing on some buttons which i have and cut right through it i'll probably be knitting on the button bands first give it a good soak maybe even a wash who knows then knit through it i just like having it go through water and drying before i do it because it does make the wool set a bit which is totally going to be on your side if you're going to stick and yeah if you're wondering where you add the button bands it's not anywhere near the stick it's actually at the well, when I say steek, where you cut, it's nowhere near where you cut, it's near the steek. So this is the steek stitches, right? One pearl, five knit, one pearl. So you just add them right here, in between here, where my fingernails are pointing. Yeah? So you pick them up, pick them up from underneath, put the knitting needle right through, pick up the strand that I hold underneath, and through. That's how I do it. There's probably lots of other ways, but I don't know if this method works for me, so yeah. Have I modified this? Oh yes. I should really take part in the fruity knitting modified garment along, but I'm pretty sure. Well, everything I work on is a whip, so it depends if they allow whips, I guess. Because uh, this thing has been modified to death. Uh, it's a bottom-up sweater, and I've turned it into a top-down cardigan with short rows for the neck. I also had some short rows down here, but I had to take them out in the end because they made the whole yoke too long and I just couldn't fit it in so now I wish I had actually put in more short rows here but because I have divided so that there are slightly more stitches for the front than for the back beyond the sleeve and body divide it does also raise the neckline so then I added some short rows at the very bottom here which you can hardly tell they're very very subtle but totally worth it it's about an extra eight rows or so which amounts to I'm gonna say an inch two and a half centimeters I think it was and the sleeves ended up being too long I'm not sure how I did that so I just folded up the cuff here and it looks really nice so I'm keeping it but yeah I did initially uh, after I knitted most of it 
just cut it in half to remove that those short rows and those extra rows there because the oak was just so long after it had been soaked it just grown and since then I pretty much got into the habit of soaking my yolks before I keep knitting the body it seems to be working out I get the true length of the yolk and I know that I'm not gonna get too much up here or too far down here <sighs> so this should be done I mean it should really be done by the next time we see each other unless I see you at unravel in which case it won't be done <laughs> and I forgot to say what yarn I am using I am not using the Bocale yarn by Kate Davis however you pronounce that I am using Fienulgarn and PT2 which is essentially the same yarn which is why they have now been merged which is just another way of saying discontinuing PT2 and adding some of the PT2 colors to Fienulgarn renaming the yarn Fienul PT2 anyway Fienul for the entire main color and oh can i remember this i think the turquoise and the pink is pt2 because i could not find these color for fienul garn so i sure hope they added those colors to fienul by now uh the dark brown is also pt2 again really hope they have transferred that into fienul uh again the main color fienul and the yellow and the red i believe is also fienul so it's a good mishmash and this is probably the main reason i am mourning the loss of pt2 which we will get back to in the acquisitions <laughs> i just really feel like this stripe here is so much nicer than these and these that are made in phenol so this is a pure pt2 these are pure phenol i just think it's nicer it's so filled up more i can't put my finger on it it might just be up in my head because they really are the same yarn i just PT2 you guys, I, it's sad but it's understandable because they are so similar. It makes no sense for one company to have two yarns that are this much alike. As for <laughs> the sweater I designed in PT2, you can of course use um, Pinot Garn for that. I pretty much assumed that PT2 would be discontinued at the time that I started this design. So not to worry there, you can use pretty much any thin two-ply yarn under the sun. It's no focus. Why is there no focus? Can we have focus? This is why people get riled up about the focus when they're podcasting. Sometimes it's just not happening. But yes, the sweater, it is coming. It's coming. I think it will be released in this February, this month, this February month, yes. Um, I just, what I have left to do is take into account all the feedback I got from test knitters which has been amazing have a conversation with my tech editor and estimate yardage so I've asked all my test knitters to estimate yardage for me but there are so many ways to modify this sweater so there are some points where I need to so I need to get meters estimates for my test knitters however this sweater is highly modifiable and anyone can knit at the length that they are I mean, when people are knitting a garment to help me, I'm not gonna expect them to knit exactly at the measurement of my pattern. I expect them to knit them to fit them because it's gonna be a sweater that they will get to keep and wear. So it better fit them. And that's the whole point of this pattern even. It contains a lot of tools for you to fit it to you. But I'm trying to make it beginner friendly still. And this is funny because I've been getting two types of feedback from my test knitters. Uh, one of them is huge enthusiasm of how beginner friendly it is. Um, like anyone who's new to a top down color work yoke should definitely try this. And the other feedback is, mm, I guess you've not intended this for beginners, but that's fine. It's still a good pattern. So I think what this pattern will be is something that will take the beginner to the next level. That is what I'm aiming for and I'm hoping to achieve that. Um, so it doesn't spoon feed you but it tells you what you need to know and puts you in a position where you can make decisions for yourself. Uh, which I think is exciting and I am very excited to have it out there. It's not the most conventional yoke pattern if you go by Ravelry standards but it does offer way 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 more than your average Norwegian yoke pattern so I'm hoping to kind of bridge the gap between the two same thing that I did with the Selby mittens essentially let's nah, let's talk about that when I'm actually releasing the pattern at this point at this rate 
about two out of three testinators have finished. I obviously have way more testinators than three, but that's just like the general percentage, about 60% or so, have finished knitting. And I need to wait for the other third, right? So it will come out this month, that's all I can say. And same with the Transcendent socks. I really want to do announce that they will come out in this episode. Thing is, I have changed the pattern for the better but if you are really squinting and looking closely at the photos that I have, um, it doesn't look the same because the pattern has been improved beyond what the socks I've knitted are. Should I be perfectionist and wait until I've knitted a sock that looks like the pattern? It's a very, very small difference. It's just that some people look very close at the photos and like, it's different. Um, so I don't know what to do there. It's ready, really. It's just me being a perfectionist, which is hilarious because I was just giving advice to a friend where I was saying like, no, 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 if it's enough to do 80% of your full effort to get it to the point where you want it, if 80% is enough, just do 80%. Don't add the extra 20% to get yourself exhausted to achieve this goal that is really only in your head where everyone else thinks 80% of what you had in mind is amazing. And I'm totally doing the opposite of my own advice. <laughs> Speaking of doing just 80%, <laughs> I was marking a bunch of exams and every time I mark exams for university, I get this sort of imposter syndrome where I am just thinking, I'm going to be found out. I'm going to be found out that I'm not good at marking, that I don't know what I'm doing, that I'm not doing this properly. Ah, And I just got the best feedback I've gotten on any job I've ever done so I think that stands to what I'm trying to say here in terms of knitting I ignore that 100% of your full ability and capacity that you have in your mind and try to think if I just instead of going all the way just go enough of the way and if that is enough it's enough have a cup of tea instead you know just chill you've done your job you don't need to do it perfect uh, but that sock pattern though. <laughs> you know what? I'm just gonna say it here and now. The pattern is out now. I'm releasing it now. It's gonna have a discount code here. It will be out. Whether I've knitted the second sock in time for the episode to come out, it will, the pattern will be out. I can't put it off any longer. Uh, the difference in the sock is just the heel. The heel is better in the pattern. That's it. The pattern is out. There, I decided right now. Happy sock knitting. <laughs> I just had to give up on that sweater. I don't know what's up with this cardigan though, I'm just doing this peekaboo hole. Anyway, I had to give up on the knitwear for today. I mean, I can't move my arms in this thing. I just can't. But it's so beautiful. So I'm really tempted to actually, yes, you heard me right, knit bottom up, put all these back on the needles, just measure a bit so I know the length that I need modify a lot like just remove maybe the flowers between here so that i can sneak in some increases and add them to my rate it's totally doable so i love this and i love the design it's just like this straight line here isn't not the shape i have for sure <laughs> so i think this can be modified now that i look at it this way and see what is and isn't so important i can do this yeah and I do enjoy yoga, so this can be a treat that I am saving for myself at some point. Because just look at this. Oh, if you could feel this yarn. If you could just feel this yarn. Oh, my days. And it's perfect for this design. It's absolutely perfect. I mean, this is the softest color work suitable yarn I have ever come across. Laxton's Limited, BFL Massam. Also dyed by the Knitting Goddess and Countess Ablaze. And look, it looks hand-dyed. It's so marbled, it actually comes across as being hand-dyed, but it's not dyed at all. It's a natural something. I am also thinking about actually knitting up my Knitting Goddess dyed black version of that yarn into the Granito by Hoi Locatelli. Yes, you heard it here first. So I'm just taking my sweet time now because I'm out of knitting things to talk about. <laughs> So the only thing I have left to talk about now is really just referring to a couple of things we discussed in the last episode, acquisitions from Norway and what I did in Norway. So if you are not up for that, I mean I'm done showing off what I have knitted since last time, so we can catch each other later. Um, so yes, I 
had a really interesting discussion with you guys last time. Uh, I've yet to get on top of all the comments, but I have read them and I found everything so thoughtful, which is what it was exactly what I was hoping for because it's really scary when you come up with a very kind of bold claim which was basically the claim made by Arne and Carlos, the video I'll link to, which I've still linked to below, about yarn dominance. And to give you the gist of it is that in Norway we don't really talk about yarn dominance a lot. I have heard mentions of it but it tends to be mentions from people who read um, foreign knitting books who have learned this from outside of Norway. In Norway we don't really talk about yarn dominance which is surprising perhaps when we do knit colour work so much. And so Arne and Carlos basically say that colour dominance is bad tension and I was sort of nodding along to that and I'm like yes but actually I'm probably sat somewhere in between which I was kind of uh, gently reminded by by some of the comments it seems like people put different meanings behind yarn dominance so if I can just try to explain this properly so when I talked about yarn dominance and when Anna and Carlos talked about yarn dominance it's essentially when the say you decide that the contrast color is your dominant color so you knit that in the way that makes that color pop and when you do that you have essentially knitted that color at a different gauge than the main color and that is bad tensioning. So if that is what we put behind uh, yarn dominance, then yeah, probably worth um, discussing how that isn't a thing in Norway because we do knit both colors in such a identical ways. Myself, I have both colors hang over my index finger. They're just separated by this little knuckle here. So they're knitted nearly identical. They really don't get carried in a very different way. And so let's just say that I have knitted a pattern like this. You know, like the palm of the mirror mittens. If these, every other stitch is knitted at a different tension, I'd be getting a very wonky looking palm. Every stitch really needs to be knit just as tight, which is what I do, which is why they are the same size. However, there is this other meaning behind yarn dominance that people talked about and I'm totally gonna go behind that and say that that is a thing that is definitely worth being conscious over and take into account in your knitting and that is not having different tension exactly but sort of because you are carrying the yarns in two subtly different ways, right? There will be essentially when you're holding your knitting and you look between your hand and your knitting how the yarn is traveling and there will be one above the other. For me that sounds really weird because I don't even look at that part. I have my hand so close to my knitting when I knit. It's all very tight together which is probably why I'm such a tight knitter because it's, nothing travels very far. But that's essentially what people say when they are being mindful of which colour is travelling above the other. So I'm just kind of paraphrasing now with limited knowledge myself, just FYI, and that can actually make a slight difference. So what would happen then if I had knitted any of this in a different way? If I'd suddenly done one row in here where I had switched the order of the yarns, the way I hold them over my index finger, or whatever way you hold your yarn, if I'd done for one row, if I'd done it differently, even though they're both knit at the same tension, if I just changed that one row, you'd suddenly see a completely different effect. It would be very obvious, even though when I look at this pattern, I'm like, yep, all the white stitches are the same size as the black stitches. No, yarn dominance. But actually, if I had done it the opposite way, for one row, that row would be like popping out really, really clearly. So it does seem to be some truth to yarn dominance in terms of always hold your yarn consistently, which is thankfully something I've always said, so I'm not misled anyone. Uh, but at the same time, if you find you get a very big yarn dominance, it's worth checking your tension for both colors. Say if you knit both colors in two different ways, if you have one continental style and one a throwing style, knit continental and throwing style separately in the swatch or something and see, do they measure at the same gauge? And if they don't, then I'm gonna come right up and say that yes, that is the way Arne and Carlos say is bad tension and it's probably worth exploring if that is a problem in knitting. If it's not, then you know, whatever, don't listen to me. Um, but yeah, I, that is what I have gathered from that discussion. I'm still happy to be corrected and informed uh, politely, because I always like, every time I put information out there in the big void, it's always 
bits of oh no I've said something wrong and uh, yeah so be gentle with me <laughs> but I was really really pleasantly uh, not even surprised but like just pleasantly pleased that this discussion was so fruitful and thoughtful and informative and I just really loved my comment section at that point that was uh, yeah uh, you always worry when these things come out that it's gonna generate a lot of grumpy people but it didn't I found it very constructive and nice so thank you all so much for your input happy to continue the discussion below and moving on to something a bit related because every time I talk about these things I talk about how I knit and any other time as well I get questions about can't you make a knitting video showing how you knit and how you hold your yarn and every time I say no I've said no lots of times on this podcast and I get a question at least once a week if I can make these videos and no it's still the answer because I am not in the tutorial making business because tutorials are hard they're really hard and time consuming to make that is the main reason. The other reason is also sometimes people say, well, you should have some tutorial videos to come along with your patterns. And in addition to the reasons that I just mentioned, the other reason I don't want to do that is because I don't want that to be standard. I don't want that to be the, the norm with patterns that they should come with tutorials. As much as I love patterns that are interactive and have links to techniques and what have you, I. I I think it's unfair for designers to have that be the expectation when really you can understand writing you just are more of a visual learner because I am too I am but I just don't think it's a fair expectation of designers to suddenly also become video producers I don't want that to be the norm I think we need to trust ourselves with the stuff that it says in the pattern just try it I do get like vast vast majority of the feedback I get from my patterns is that they are very understandable but some of the feedback is that people don't quite know what to do and in all of those cases the very few cases but still it's because they don't trust themselves they understand the instructions but they don't believe them so they don't want to try them and they instead come to me and say I don't understand this bit and I'm like no just do what it says and they do what it says and it works out so just trust yourself a bit as well. You don't need to see it in a tutorial. It's written, just do it. I know it sounds weird, just do it. <sighs> the most common thing, and I think I can just cover that here now, is when you knit this bit. Sometimes, I mean, the funny thing in my pattern is suddenly, what's the last stitch of the round is suddenly the beginning stitch of the next round. Guys, it doesn't matter what's the beginning and the end of the round, as long as you knit according to the chart. You can take your stitch marker out and throw it out the window doesn't matter what's the beginning of the round if you started here you can bind over up here doesn't matter who cares in this entire thing really um so that's one thing and the other thing is sometimes it's weird when considering that the black here should overlap with the next white stitch here as this case style the black stitch here should overlap with this white stitch and they're two together style Sometimes when you do SSK, you see the white colour from below pop out. I have tried to fix that here, so it's not very obvious. And <laughs> it's not even focusing. And in those cases, really, just tease things around with your knitting needle. Like, just poke through, just get darning needle or something, and shove that white stitch down and bring up that black stitch. You really just need to fiddle around with it, because that's just the downside of SSK and the way you tension the two stitches when you shift them about. It's still knitted perfectly okay, and it will block out nicely. All oh, will be fine but it's just something as part of the process of the way you rearrange the stitches. Um, it can just make the white stitch that is underneath the black stitch pop out, so it's fine. Digression. I was talking about tutorials. <laughs> I was trying to list the reasons why I don't do tutorials. The main reason is actually that I don't mind making them for you guys. It's just I don't have time. But say if I had time and I put in all the effort that it needed and I was actually able to do it, that's the other reason. I'm not actually able to do it either. They're, every time I've tried to make some, they're bad. They're really bad. Um, but let's say all of those things were away and I was still capable in that time capacity. You could check out any tutorial out there, the best ones you know of. There will always be someone who is grumpy that it wasn't what they were looking for. And I'm just not here for that. Yes, sure, it would generate all the views and all the ad revenue and 
I'm just not here for it. I don't want to make time-consuming, difficult videos for people to come. People who don't watch the podcast to just come and tell me how lousy they are. So that is one of the many reasons I can't do them. I don't have time to do them. They're terrible. I would get bad feedback even if I put in all the efforts that I possibly could. And the main, main reason, the reason above all, the reason to unite them and control them and whatever the ring does. There are videos out there that are better than whatever I can make. There are color work videos out there. There are videos of knitting color work continental style. And there are videos out there of making two-handed color work and probably throwing and Portuguese and Eastern European and Icelandic. And there are videos already. You don't need them from me. It's not like I've figured out anything that nobody else has figured out before me. You know, I'm not doing anything new and outrageously different. So there are videos already. That's the other reason I don't see it worth my time to do these things so there's that the other thing i want to say is i'm going to unravel so if you see me there say hi uh i can't really read into people's faces if they watch the podcast so it kind of has to go in that order it's a bit unfair because it's really like i feel terribly awkward if i walk up to someone who i watch the podcast off or i knit their designs or love their yarn or what have you to walk up to them if they have no idea who i am you guys are really brave you do that because i just I can't yeah so I will be there on Saturday and if anyone wants to say howdy you know I'm there it's gonna be fun I love getting out of London and I seem to be doing that an awful lot and I have been to Norway so I thought we could look through the acquisitions the acquisitions I got a fair bit of yarn because as I said they have decided to discontinue one of my favorite yarns old PT2 which I've had for years and years and years. It's one of the old yarns, you know. It's been improved over the years as well. I feel like it's gotten, the spinning of the yarn has been of a higher quality and it's gotten softer while still retaining all the positive qualities that sometimes you have to compromise with softness, but that's not been the case. It's really just been such a good work horse, horse yarn and uh, yeah, taking away. So I bought everything. I got a bunch of sweater quantities, so I'm not going to take out every skein to show you. So we can live under the delusion that I didn't really get that much. But I'm going to show you each and every colour, because the colours are the main thing that will make me miss PD2. I always found their shade card to be a better one than Funeral. So I'm really excited to see the new shade card where they have merged together the two. It better be good. So the first thing I had to get was a sweater quantity in this amazing shade of burgundy. I expect I won't have to explain this to you. <laughs> I actually even bought this just before they put all the PT2 yarn on sale. That was a bit of a bummer. But the rest of the yarn I did get on sale. It was just this colour that I had to get right away. Couldn't take any risks there. Look at that deep, deep, deep colour. Like, of all the shades of burgundy I am heavily preoccupied with, this is the main one. Like, this, this is everything. So, I might get on my design horse again and see if I can do a cardigan. I've been thinking about doing a cardigan. It's in some ways easier to design and in some ways diffi more difficult and I need to just do the challenge so cardigan. I also got an enormous wetter quantity of this yarn which I can't even tell you the colour of it it's a bit similar to that Quince and Co Lark yarn I got in New York where it's like it's kind of smoky and dark but it has a hint of blue and green but not much it's like I don't really know but I love it, so I got so much of this colour. I... It's gonna be something. I also had to get one more of these. So I used this colour in my Miss Rachel and I really liked it. So I couldn't just say goodbye to it forever. So whatever I end up doing with this, in case they haven't transferred this colour into Finul, I just had to get a skein. <sighs> and we all know I needed another red sweater quantity. So I got one. This is the 59 colorway. But I, I don't know if there's any point in telling you the colorways now because it's all gone. Got the last one. And I got a mustard yellow. Look at that. So I already have one yellow sweater quantity. It's in that color, but it's a sweater quantity. It's a little bit more of a sunflower yellow, whereas this is more mustard. And I was talking to my sister and she wants another garment. I say another, like I made a one Marius a couple of years ago, so I guess it's time again. Um, and yes, she wanted a yellow cardigan, which is like, 
You, since when did you wear yellow? But then again, since when do I wear yellow? So I need to get myself a yellow sweater quantity so I can use the old yellow sweater quantity in Hillesvog Ask for her. Because I feel like this yellow might be more me and that yellow might be more her. So that's just how that's gonna go. I have plans for it, sort of. I also had to get like just four skeins of this. So that pink yarn, by the way, I did just get one skein. That was not a sweater quantity. The other ones were. But this one I just got four because I figured I could just use it as a contrast with the others somehow. And it's just... I love this. They Again, they better have kept this for Fiener because this is fabulous. And I did also get more of the PT5, their sport yarn as they call it. I got two of each of these colours. But you wonder what I'm going to do with all these PT5 yarns. I also got a hank of Usk. So I got this at Lit. Uh, Vat, I think, in this Volan in Tomheim, and they really just had one black yet left. I was hoping to get a charcoal, but they only had 50 grams, and I would need 100 because my plan, I think, will be to add this black and the other black skin I already have into the Mama Looker shorts. Because, yes, I got the Gastrike um, yarn from Yarbu, which is the recommended yarn, but it's in such a light shade of grey, I feel like I will probably feel very uncomfortable in that over my larger areas of my body so i think knitting in pure black is going to be awfully boring but it's going to be something i'll actually want to wear so got a black skin and at the very last we have a wet label uh that is a bit concerning but it's a skein of fine wool from stuff for steel i don't know why i got this color i just had to get one skein of this because i mean it's kind of nuts I think it could go into the Threadmuir sweater by Isolde Teague. Because um, I've been thinking about casting it on, but I don't have the colours that I'd like to use in it. I know that's crazy, but I don't. So. I've been looking into some JC Rennie, but they didn't have the yellow I needed. So if, I never, if I'm never going to get that yellow, I might look into this. But if not, this can be something else, because it's a really, really nice yarn. Definitely recommend the fine wool at stuff for steel for any sort of delicate knits like a shawl or a vintage sweater something yeah a bit delicate so that was all the yarn but th it doesn't stop there never does because i got a magazine so this is the annual kofta magazine by the magazine familien the family and every year I struggle to get this because every year they release it after i've left norway for christmas Back to London and it comes out like mid-January and so my mum has to buy it and send it to me. It's always a bit of a power struggle because <clears throat> she doesn't want to send me stuff. <laughs> she doesn't want to go out and buy stuff either so I managed to get it for myself this time which is the first and it's just full of colorwork cardigans. I mean just yes. Uh, let's see if I can show you any examples. Pretty difficult to show off magazines to be honest. Pretty cute. And this is pretty nice too. Like I'm not in love with most cardigans in this particular issue, but it's just become a thing like every year. So where's that again? That's a really nice one. I think it's by Cardi Hessness. She's just owning cardigans lately. I already had this pattern, but it doesn't hurt to have another one. <laughs> so yeah, I just as far as I'm aware you can only get this in Norway. It's just like a magazine you know they don't export those and fortunately no I can't help anyone get this uh, something I just have to say every time but yes I I am in London now so not something I can help with distribution of lastly uh my mom's been sat at the sewing machine again because it was my birthday and I guess she figured that instead of buying me something uh because quite frankly I seem to be buying plenty myself she could make me project bags because that is something that she apparently it's got a knack for uh, and starting to enjoy making so you, she started by making her own kind of beach bags and now she is in full-on project bag production for me <laughs> and oh it's funny when my mom makes me stuff because no matter how much I want those things and no matter what way I decide to show it she will still get very upset with me that I'm not showing gratitude the same way so if I'm like oh exciting exciting she'll be like don't be so greedy and if I'm uh, keeping my distance she's like you're not even happy to see what I made you you don't even want to look at it mm -hmm. but regardless she's been very generous and made me bags so just gonna have to go through that process of moods 
So you remember the bag I got last time that she made? It was in this fabric, but now I got a drawstring version of it. Isn't that nice? I feel like this. It used to have a red band, but we both agreed that the grey would suit it better. I'm so glad that she said it first, because if I had said it first, you know what would happen. I'd be ungrateful. Yaddy yaddy. <laughs> so there we are. It has a pocket on the inside. It's really funny because she keeps asking like, oh, do you want a pocket in the inside? I'm like, no, I don't really use them. Yeah, but do you want a pocket? I can make a pocket. Oh, I don't really need them, but we could add them. Yeah, if you want some. She just really wants to add pockets. So I'm like, yeah, fine, add a pocket. <laughs> so it has a pocket on the inside. And there we are. I just really like it. It's such a full, like, proper capacity bag. Like, it fits a lot. Like, it's got a huge square bottom. But once you, like, just pull it together, it really looks quite small. Which I think is brilliant. So I really like this. And it matches my other bag. And I like the simple, the simplicity of it, so. That was one. Oh yeah, I got a few. I got this one, which I really like. I love this fabric. I selected all these fabrics uh, around Christmas when we went fabric shopping. <sighs> oh, I just really love this. And it has a hidden zipper because apparently I chose the wrong zipper when we went to buy zippers. So. But it looks actually quite nice. I like it. It fits really well with the aesthetic of this. The very simple aesthetic. And the fabric is just the plain canvas fabric that we got from Ikea. And I really like how long it is because that means I can just do this and my bag will stand on its own. And have all the yarn in it. Yep. And yes, I have tried to tell my mum that this is something she could sell. You know, she could start herself an Etsy or something and sell these. She's just like, ah, oh, they take me all day to make. I don't know. Nah. <laughs> so she's not going to go into full production. It's just not going to happen. Maybe for her colleague, you will get one in one year, you know? It's like at that level. Um, so I think this might just be my favorite. I am going to get a bigger one in the same fabric, which I am so excited about because... Dragons! <laughs> oh... Look at that, I just this fabric. I mean, the most exciting part of the fabric shop that I went to, Stoff of Steel, is the children's section, where the children's fabrics are. That's where I get the best ones. And this one and the next one were sourced from there. So this is the dragon. And uh, my mom kind of messed up here, according to herself, that she added the same square bottom that really only the drawstring bags should have. So the bottom is a bit too uh, big. She should have taken out a bit less. Uh, her words, mind you. Don't want anyone else to tell me I'm ungrateful now. Uh, again, same lining on the inside as the others, and no pocket this time, it's fine. <laughs> um, this one she made while I wasn't there, so. I really like it. Perfect for mittens or what have you, and yeah, dragons! And the last one, I mean, I suggested adding some. Uh, I forgot what it's called when you add like a thing between the two fabrics that you kind of iron into the Outside fabric to make it stiffer. That's a word for that. Uh, I suggested getting that. Mom's never tried it. So she's like, why do we need that? I don't know. And I'm like, yes, yes, let's try it. So we got some. And added it to the last bag that she made while I was there. Look at that. It's so stiff. It's like become a proper thick canvas bag. And look at the fabric. Look at this fabric. Again, I found this at the children's fabric section. And there's like a rabbit that's wearing a like woolen sweater with lice patterns. Hee hee hee. It's so nice and it's huge. And drawstring. This is definitely a sweater bag. It's big. So yeah, it got a pocket because <laughs> yeah, couldn't talk her out of it. I don't mind the pockets personally. I just find that I never use them. She's always going on the same way about like handles. She's like, oh sure, I don't want a handle. I'm like, I don't really use the handles, but you can have a handle. Yeah, I just don't know that I use them. You can add them if you want. She's like, you don't really use them. Communication. But hey, project bag. This should be the photo for this episode, shouldn't it? Just like sat here looking clever. So yeah, that was the last bag that my mum made me this round, but I know she has a few others planned because she does want to 
use up all the fabrics. But these are all the fabrics that we got. So it's just going to be more bags with the same fabrics, which I am very excited about. Uh, but the last project bag that I have to show was something that got in my mail yesterday. You will have seen this before if you watch the Knitting Expat podcast. Because it's the same bag that she got and when she posted this on Instagram I just immediately jumped onto the thimble and thread shop and got the last mustard yellow canvas bag in her shop. So if you couldn't get one, that was my fault. Sorry. And before I show you more of the bag, I just also want to show you the stitch markers that I got with it. And I think you can see why I uh, ended up with these stitch markers and... Uh, Yes, the answer is the mittens. I mean, they're all fabulous, but I mean, I had to get the mittens. So, I guess I'm one of the people that buy stitch markers now. Anyway, um, this is her logo, in case you were curious. So yeah, Thimble and Thread Make. So, let's talk about the bag. Should we try that one as well? Oh, it's big. It's My voice sounds funny in here. It's really big, is what I'm trying to say. You need to like try out with your head if you're gonna test that project bag because otherwise it's too small. <laughs> so it's got a huge square bottom. It could fit anything with a square bottom, honestly. And the canvas is so sturdy that it's actually quite hard to close it properly. But just like any kind of strong canvas material, it softens up every time you do this. And I'm already, I can already tell it was easier to do it this time around than the first time around. And I've done it a couple of times now, just to kind of give the fabric some exercise and give myself some exercise as well. So yeah, what I really like is that this is a... A UK production it's a bit more within my price range than other comparable canvas bags that I know are all the rage like there's one in Norway and there's like this one in America and it's like canvas bags are a thing and none of them have really been according to my budget but I finally found one that is and yeah it's obviously it's well known for the buttoned inside where you can button up the lining to add your enamel pins without having the enamel pins snag on your knitting because the little pointy things will be on the inside of the lining which is really clever uh, I have one hang up about this bag it's that it's the lining is made corner to corner but only for two corners so if I pull up the lining this is the lining okay and this is the bag. It's got a square bottom, the lining does not. And you know how hung up I get about the symmetry in shawls. I think this is a similar thing, but I just wish that it was a square bottom lining as well. Because when I put, like, shove the two corners into the corners of the canvas material, like this, get a nice flat bottom, yes. But when I try to do it for the other ends, it doesn't, it's like hanging there like a hammock, and I don't get to use. You see that? I don't get to use the full space of the bottom and it just irks me and I kind of want to change the lining if I was able to because I just wish it would make more use of the all the space inside because it really doesn't at this point. But it, I mean there's plenty of space still, like, there's nothing to complain about, this is the biggest project bag I have. And it's mustard yellow, it comes across as a bit more sunflower yellow up there but definitely mustard here for sure. I think it's just like is my blue in the light on the camera for some reason um so yes we are nearing the end of the episode so i just thought i'd talk about something i guess personal again that is what the end of the video is for and as you will see i am back in london after my slightly shorter than one week stay in norway and i didn't get to podcast there it was a very busy time all around and so that just didn't happen. I didn't get to vlog anything. It just wasn't really appropriate, I will say. I mean, I arrived late on Tuesday. So while I managed to roam the city a little bit on Wednesday, my family arrived in the evening. And so we had dinner out. And then on Thursday morning, lunchtime, I guess, I um, met up with some of my family members so that we could have a kind of conversation I guess about my nan's life my nan who passed away so that that 
could be put into a speech that was read at her funeral so that we could have her life summarized basically and that was strangely therapeutic i have never really taken part in that before usually when i'm at funerals i am just listening and i'm like it's funny how they know all this stuff about this person who died and i'm like ah this is how it works so i was really happy to be part of that and learn a few things about my nun's life and also be able to share my how i felt about having her as my grandmother because she really was there for me growing up she was looking after me and my sister when we were a bit too much for my mom when she became a single parent because my grandmother lost her son, my dad, way too soon and that was really really hard on her and it was not the first time that life was unfair to my grandmother so it was quite moving to go through all of that and uh, a couple of aunties had to leave the room occasionally especially like when talking about her my grandmother's great love, which was um, her German fiancé who had to leave Norway after the war and he actually was working the next two years to get my grandmother and their son over to Germany. But in 1947 he was hit by a car and died instead of getting his future wife and son there. Obviously if that hadn't happened I wouldn't have been born, so there's that. But. Uh, it makes me feel bad for my grandmother. I wish she would have had that life in a way. Um, so yeah, I learned a few things and I kind of started to remember her more as she was. Because lately I've just kind of remembered my grandmother who was in the nursing home and who was in the flat but really just wasn't capable of looking after her own home. I just, it came back to me like how it used to be that when I went downtown I could suddenly see this like grey shadow going shush. And that was my grandmother walking about in town because she used to take the bus downtown and walk about with a grey coat and a grey hat and her grey curly hair and yeah she was just like she was always on her feet you know and i've just almost forgot that in a way and what it was like to just stay at her place because i guess growing up i always felt like people were always trying to put me in my place you know like trying to get unruly ellie to behave Except my grandmother, when we came to her place, it was just nice. We just got to sit there in our pyjamas in the duvets in front of the TV until way too late. And we got to eat sweets as much as we wanted. We got, oh, it was just, we were spoiled and we were spoiled on purpose because once we, when we were said grandmother, it's supposed to be nice. So it's kind of like giving me an opportunity to properly miss that because couldn't really miss it when she was still alive even though all those things were way gone and my grandmother was very much affected by her dementia so it, it's been gone for a long time you know this isn't new but it sort of came back to me in a way and that was nice and so when it came to the funeral on Friday uh I have mixed feelings about how the actual funeral went. I guess I would have had some things different, but I love the location that we had chosen. And in the end, we, the grandchildren, some of us anyway, uh, carried out her, what do you say, chest? Uh, is it called chest? It's not called coffin, that sounds very morbid. Anyway, we carried her out, six of us. I mean, they're more grandchildren, but yeah. I think it was five grandchildren and my uncle so it's a bit some people just didn't feel like they had the strength to do it and i was like actually um, i can do it it's fine. and i'm glad i did it was a nice symbolic thing uh usually you would carry um the chest if you will uh to it's probably not the word but to where she would be buried but because we had it at a different place than where she was going to be buried then it was actually just uh, lifting it up into a funeral car, if you can call them that, and she can just draw away. And it's different, but it sort of made sense and it was nice. And um, yeah. So you know, as you can see, there was quite a busy time. Again, again on Saturday, I met with the family, and then they left during the day to wherever in the country they live, and, and then I went out to a knit night with a bunch of knitters, which was really nice. And. I feel like I said so many dumb things. 
<laughs> I was just so knackered. It was a quite the week, you know, and uh, when I finally was able to sit down and knit with a, a bunch of knitters instead of family, 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 I uh, I think I could have used some filtering. Um, I just feel like I say so many dumb things. But anyway, I was really happy to have that knit night to kind of, yeah, zone out of the whole funeral business and kind of get back into my knitting self again. And on Sunday, I met with some friends of mine, which I finally got time to. And, oh, that's funny. I was actually visiting uh, the... I call him like my best friend. Obviously, I don't rank my friends, but we have been friends for the longest. This month, me and my friend Inga, we have been friends for 20 years. 20 years in the winter holiday in Norway. We were still at the... We call it the after school, which is like what you do if you still have to be at school or somewhere because your parents are working. And so we were pretty much the only kids there. And so because there were no one else to play with, he came up to me and was like, do you want to play? And I was like, sure. And so we just got up to a bunch of mischief already then and broke a bunch of rules and played uh, dress up in places in the school that were really shut for the holiday that we weren't supposed to go to. <laughs> So yeah, been friends ever since. 15 years of schooling, being like just inseparable troublemakers. Um, yes, we went to 13 years of, no, 10 years of obligatory school. And then we did three years of uh, upper secondary school. And then we did a year of what's called a folk high school. And then a first year of university before we parted ways and went on to become different things. So while I'm a academic PhD student, he is a social worker for children in school. Uh, it's just funny to think that we have been friends for 20 years. That is nuts. I no, <laughs> haven't had any friends lost for that long. Although I tend to be one of those people that keep friends for a long time. I don't have that friend for so many years and that friend for so many years. I tend to string them along for the ride. They don't. As soon as people become friends with me, I don't let go of them. So, happy anniversary to us, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, at last Monday I left for London. It was Tuesday yesterday and I pretty much just spent that day in bed, sitting and knitting and doing nothing. <laughs> and just kind of, yeah, getting back to my life. And today's Wednesday and I need to go to work now. It's still morning, but I've uh, got stuff to do and meetings to have. And while I'm wool at night, that's gonna be fun. So, it was nice talking to you guys. Uh, lots of waffly chatter at the end of the episode, as usual. And I will see you guys next week and hopefully see some of you at Unravel. And then, of course, it's the Edinburgh Young Festival coming up very soon and I'm so excited. So thank you all so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.